Hi, I'm Daryl Urbanski, and welcome to the Best Business Podcast. My mission is to help create 200 new multimillionaire business owners. How? You'll do better when you know better. In my interviews, you'll hear from self-made millionaires, seven-figure business owners, authors, and world-class experts sharing how they did it so you can too without experiencing the same obstacles they did. Now, if you like this interview, please share it with a friend you think will benefit. They'll appreciate it, and I will as well. You can also connect with me on social media. Look for Daryl Urbanski, D-A-R-Y-L, Urban Ski, U-R-B-A-N-S-K-I, and add me so we can be friends. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy what I've prepared for you right here, right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always, and today we are joined by repeat guest James Shramko, founder of Sydney-based online marketing business, superfastbusiness.com. With a knack for business and lifestyle designing, he surfs every day and leads his multi-million dollar business without having to do a lot of launches, pay traffic, or joint ventures. He has a seven-figure business and has mastered the art of lifestyle design. Today, we're going to be talking about his new book, Work Less, Make More. I've asked him to join us here today to talk about how we can all do that for ourselves. So James, thank you for joining us, my friend, and how are you doing? Thank you for having me back. I'm doing just great. Awesome. We're talking about the surf today. You're, you're looking forward to getting your beach back from the kids once they go back to school. That's going to be... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, they're always teaching me lessons. You know, I, I, I watch where they take off and the acrobatics they do. I guess I can inspire that one day uh, I'll surf as well as a 12-year-old grommet. <laughs> <laughs> and they're so like fearless, right? Because they've never injured themselves and, you know, they've never maybe nearly drowned or, you know, been on their board when they see a shark go by. So they're just <laughs> kind of just out there doing whatever they want. Yeah. They, they like, they literally walk down to the rocks and they rock off, which is where they jump from the rock into the lineup without having to paddle out. Like they're so savvy. <laughs> that is smart. That's yeah. That's uh, a lot of shortcuts. That's awesome. So I am really excited and grateful to have you back because last I've we've interviewed a lot of people on the show and I have no qualm saying it that I feel like one of the the interview we did with you it was just very practical and very it was just good we've I've done a lot of great interviews I would say that there's you know there are interviews I've done with people that I haven't released simply because I didn't think that they were quality enough for my audience but James I'm really excited to have you back not only because I know some of the people that turn to you for advice but just from our previous interaction. Uh, I just loved what you're all about, and I've been going through your book, and I'm I'm a huge fan. I'm about I'm in chapter four right now. I'm feeling good about myself because a lot of things I'm like, yeah, I'm doing that, yeah, I'm doing that, you know. And some things I hadn't. One of the tips that I did is I did shut off all notifications entirely, and that was it was a mental relief. Um, so I'm excited to finish the book. I'm excited to talk to you about this. And I guess one of the things I wanted to get started with was kind of what inspired doing this book right now. I've been trying to do this book for a while. I, I tried five years ago and didn't succeed. And it was a combination of a few things. But um, as I progress through my business, I keep – it's kind of like building software. You think, oh, there's just this one more feature I'd like. And at five years ago, I hadn't sold my service businesses yet. So there was kind of a chapter I was waiting for. Mm. And I also – acknowledged that I need help on this book. So I hired someone to help me and she was quitting a, a real publisher mm. and she took on my project as a freelancer, but she kind of got a uh, writer's block and just sort of locked up and then didn't deliver for ages. And by the time she got back to me, it was sort of, I'd moved past that point and I had a few things going on and I was pretty busy and didn't think too much about it, but then I went and spoke at Chris Ducker's event there in Cebu, in the Philippines, mm -hmm. and he put on this event for a bunch of entrepreneurs. And for his audience, I put together a book that really simplified the steps because mm -hmm. I know with um, blogging audiences, they're very creative, they're very talented, and they're prepared to do the work. In fact, they're probably some of the hardest working people um, for the lowest amount of pay. So I put together a program for them that was going to help them get traction. And it just turned out that one of the ladies in the audience there called Kelly Exeter was really switched on by this presentation. And she came up to me and said, oh, why don't you have a book? And I said, well, I tried. And she said, I will help you. Hmm. And from you know every step of the way for the last 18 months, she has wrangled me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, cajoled information out of me, like accessed my 
community, got through my back catalog of podcasts, looked at my products, mm-hmm. got the original book manuscript. Then she asked me a stack of questions, which I recorded on audio from wherever I was at home or in Paris or, uh, you know, traveling in London. And I sent them all to her and all the transcripts and we crunched it down. It's like decades worth of transcripts and information into this very short book. It's actually uh-huh. only um, 130 something pages. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, there's like, I don't think there's a single wasted word in this book, which uh-huh. was designed for people to get through because I'm all about giving people less stuff to do, not more. Uh-huh. And uh, the second motivation was legacy. I wrote the book for my kids who are currently at ages from 15 to 22. And I wanted to give them this book and say, this is what I've learned. Like Mm -hmm. start here. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can save yourself a stack of energy. If you've ever wondered, you know, where I was during the day or what I was doing or what I actually do now, this is it. This is what I've learned. And I, I wanted it to be a book that would sit in good company on the bookshelf with some of the books that I read on my way through this mm-hmm. journey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, those are really powerful and very meaningful stuff and really kind of the only way you should do some things with the, the long game, the, the end in mind, the legacy. I really, I really love and appreciate that. Uh, I also love your focus on, you know, a, a, a good business book for busy people. So, um, and it's very actionable. That's the one thing I've really loved. It's, it's almost been... I mean, there's a lot of really smart people probably even listen to this podcast. And so I'm, like I said, I'm into chapter four and there's been some things that I've learned, but also things that have just been a good confidence booster because I've been like, yes, I'm doing that. Yes, I'm, you know what I mean? As I go through and, and uh, anyway, it's just good to have. Now, what have been some of the biggest challenges for you in getting this book out there? You did mention some of them, but were there any major <laughs> obstacles or what? Plenty of obstacles. Um, the, the sheer volume of content that we had to work with was an obstacle. Mm. Like, I've seen some books where they're more or less like a couple of bullet points Uh fluffed out into a book. Uh We were kind of the other opposite end of the scale here where we had so much stuff, it's really hard making decisions on what to to talk about. You know, what should we call it? Who's it for? What's what's the best plan of attack? It's like this spoil of choice. We, we could have produced 10 books from what we had. Uh And even one of the p- proposed book title chapter um, names didn't even make it into the book. <laughs> That's how much <laughs> we had to start with. So that was definitely a challenge. Other ones were, uh, I sort of discovered by accident when I got the first manuscript printed out and in my hands, I put off reading it for a while because I discovered that it's actually really boring reading your own book. Yeah. There's like, there's not a single scrap of new insight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it's all you. Yeah, you know, I already know. I already know this stuff. I've been speaking about it, thinking about it for years. So as I'm reading my own stuff, I'm like, yep, yeah, uh huh, mm hmm, yep, yeah, okay. And it's like a labor. And then, uh, and then finally, it's it's that um, because it is a permanent thing. It's it's printed and it's going to be around for a long time. Uh, I've it's not just the same as a podcast or a blog post or a PDF that you can just delete. This is real. So I, I guess. To, it commanded a bit more of my mm-hmm. attention to make it right. So when I got the um, the final manuscript, I spent two hours per chapter just reading it really carefully and rewording a heap of stuff. It was like rendering uh, the top level of uh, a new cement or something where you have to just make sure it's it's perfect mm-hmm. because – you know, it's my name on the front of the book and my picture. Uh, <laughs> I have to, have to make it stand for something. That's right. So there was that pressure. And um, and then when it was finally published, it's like, okay, well, now we've got to tell people about this book. So it's like the final challenge. So there's plenty of challenges, but I'm really glad we got there in the end. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm glad you got there too just because I'm enjoying it. And just like our first interview, I've just found it very yeah. insightful. And just practical, again, because I've felt the same way. I've written a couple of books myself uh, that I have on Amazon, and I felt like there's a ton of stuff out there where, you know, the whole book could have been one chapter, you know, and it's, I just, and I still get that today, all sorts of books. It's like the book is the first chapter, you get the principle of the book, and then after that, you know, it's just, it's just a bunch of case studies on it, you know, that fills another 400 pages, which is, is good, but at the same time, right? Um, but I love this. I mean, even just from the table of contents, people can glean a lot. 
I mean, the first chapter is personal effectiveness. Second chapter is planning and goal setting. The third is focus and the power of the 64-4, which is like the Pareto principle, the 80-20, focusing on, you know, on the, on the critical few versus the trivial many. That's one. Uh, building a team is chapter four. We hit that drum all the time on the show that to accomplish things, you have to have a team around you that otherwise you won't do much as an entrepreneur. Uh, chapter five, an offer that converts. That's something I want to dive into more. I'm actually I was hoping to get to that chapter before we had this call because I really think that that's a major, major topic for people uh, in any business that they're in, no matter whether they're a solopreneur or they're already in a team or in a software business. Having an offer that converts is something I feel so many people trip up over and get wrong. But if you get it right, that can grow a, a substantial business. So I would love to get your insight on that. Chapter six, cash flow and the profit formula. Chapter seven, the customer lifetime value, which is one of the most important numbers in any business. Chapter eight, choosing the right business model, which is critically, critically important um, because so many people, they shoot themselves in the foot by, in a, by operating a model that's, that's doomed to failure before they even get started. And then chapter nine, no compromise. So already, just by going through the table of contents, I feel like if you were a brand new entrepreneur, without having even read the book, you already kind of get some direction and focus. You know, like, oh, I need to be effective personally. I need to make sure I'm setting some goals. I need to build a team. I need an offer that converts. I need to think about cash flow and profit. And I need to think about my customer lifetime value and business models. What's a business model? So, again, it's a really good practical book. Um, are you still there? Because I've been rambling for a bit. Yeah. Okay. No, oh, okay. You're, you're doing great. Yeah. Like you, you're running this um, podcast as if you've done it before. Yeah. I think um, – <laughs> I was speaking to someone yesterday and they said, oh, it's, it's almost like the chapters are laid out in a sequence that builds upon the one before it. I'm like, well, it's funny that. <laughs> There's also an extra chapter that isn't in the book that is part of the book and I made it a downloadable from my website and it's called Own the Race Course and it's something I'm known for and it's a whole philosophy on uh, in this case, it's how you apply it to publishing, but how you can actually take control and not um, be subjecting yourself to potential doom and gloom mm. if you were to be shut down with a single point sensitive traffic source. So if you combine all of those, yeah, I think we ended up with a book that is quite meaningful and, and you really are up to the exciting part of the book. I think where you're about to get to is where all the money's made. Uh, but the first part of the book is essential to go through because without that, you will never get to the part where you right. get to make the money. Yeah. So it's it's a it's an interesting scenario, but a, a lot of the high-level innovations that I'm helping people with actually start with the most seemingly basic stuff, like how mm -hmm. do they get out of their inbox and how do they get off Facebook? Mm -hmm. If people could just do those two things, then they've actually got time and energy to focus on doing the things that matter. And then so the rest of the book covers, you know, what are those things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember in our first interview I did with you, you mentioned something. I forget what you said, but you were just, there was no, I just loved how, how brass you were about it. You're like, we, you weren't talking about me in any way, shape or form, but you were talking about a potential, you know, person who's struggling in their business. And you were saying like, oh, you know, well, maybe you just aren't really that productive or something. And you said something about like getting a time tracker, which I saw you mentioned in the book. Now, I've been notorious for my like among myself and planning my day in 30 minute blocks. And, you know, and I try to live my day every every I try to live every day. I almost feel like you live this way as if I had to spend every day like if I was stuck in a loop where every day I had to live the same 24 hour period. So. When you talk about like work-life balance, I try to balance my day so I do make time. I have a checklist. Like, did I con did I spend some time talking with family and friends today? Do you know what I mean? Like that way, I don't be do the entrepreneurial thing of just disappearing for like a month and coming out, you know, like looking like a bushman with a big beard and whatever. But I remember what you said something about like maybe you're just not focused or attentive, or, you know. And you mentioned using a time tracker, and I actually did that, and it was a surprise to me because I would schedule my day out, but then when I was actually working. I wasn't getting as much focus, like I wasn't focusing on some of those things as much as I had hoped. And so that was something, and like you mentioned, like the fundamentals, sometimes the fundamentals are fundamental, you know? And so even if someone's running a $7 million business or whatever, you know, it's, they, they, they may have had the fundamentals in place before, but it's that whole like, oh, why did I stop doing that, you know, thing where now they've gone off track somehow and it's causing problems for them. So, uh, yeah. So again, it's a, it's a great book. Now, can you speak a little bit about building a team? And then I am going to ask you about offers that convert because I feel like knowing my audience, these tend to be the biggest sticking points for these, 
for these group of people. You know, building and managing the team and having them dele- and being able to delegate effectively, knowing who to who to hire, those sorts of things. And then the offer that converts, you know, so many people are constantly doing new, 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 new things in their business. And uh, I just don't, I think if an offer that converts was so easy to come up with, you know, more people would have them. So could you maybe speak to those two, two pieces for me a little bit? Like, Sure. Well, you know, building a team actually starts with your task list in a way. Um, surprisingly, I think if you compared people's to-do list with the stuff they actually spend time on their computer, you'd see two different lists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's what we solve with um, time tracking. We just become aware of where we spend our time. So um, the second part of what you said, I think, is true. We are in a loop, like we're literally traveling around the sun. <laughs> and if you want next year to be the same as this year and the year after that, you just keep doing what you're doing. So if you were to take your task list and decide, well, of these tasks, which ones could I have someone else to do because they need to be done but not by me because I'm either not good at it or I just don't want to do it, um, then we can start whittling away and leaving just the things that are very useful for us to do. There are going to be things that we want to do in our business or that we should be doing, the, the things that pay us better. Mm-hmm. So I spent the first sort of introduction teaching a formula on how to score those activities. So let's assume that we've discovered things that we shouldn't be doing but need to get done, then we would not want to build a team around us. So most of us know how to do this we'll call pizza and have our dinner outsourced. Uh, but we can also do that with other parts of our business that we might be spending time on and not even thinking about it. So I remember I used to sit down at my big table once a year and tip all my receipts out and do my um, paperwork for about two or three days <laughs> to then go <laughs> off to the accountant with my actual shoebox full of receipts and a workbook summarizing all the tallies. But these days, someone in my team updates our online bookkeeping software on a daily basis. I never touch account. Before I even get home from the shops of, from buying um, a telephone charger, someone in my team will have already allocated it to office business expenses on my online bookkeeping. It's amazing. Mm. And there's so many other things. So I came up with this idea, well, I really just want to get one layer back from all the stuff that I um, would be spending time on. So I don't log into my website, to my WordPress website. I don't log into my shopping cart. I don't log into my help desk. I don't log into my my autoresponder, all of these things my team does. And now I just log into Slack where my team lives you know, virtually mm-hmm. online and I just operate that with the team and they're operating all those front-end machines. And uh, the other thing that that leaves me to do is just uh, turn up for my customers. I can coach them and I can create content. So they're the two main jobs that I have in my business is mm. to create content that helps people find my services and then when they buy my services, I deliver on the service. That's it. The team leveraging. So with team, you're probably going to cap your income. You might make a high profit margin, but you will probably find a limit somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe you're okay with that. But what I have discovered is that most people have not had much training on team building and um, they kind of suck at it. And it's not their fault, but in, when dealing with humans is actually really complicated. Uh, it's, it's like, as you know, we change from one time of the day to the other, let alone days of the week, let alone years. Mm-hmm. But when you throw this sort of cocktail of all these different people and all the things that need to get done, you definitely need uh, systems. You need to um, establish some sort of boundaries as to where the business operates within. Um, there are plenty of mistakes that people make. Like they're generally, they're not hiring when they could have. They they need to get onto it a bit quicker. They should be protecting themselves from one person leaving. Pretty common when that person might need to quit for some reason, whatever reason, whether it's um, family reasons, a change of career, or an emergency of some kind. Then you're stuck doing it again. So I've built on systems that I learnt in my career and that I've observed in other businesses, like. When you fly in a plane, there's usually a co-pilot and they go through checklists. And that's exactly what we do in our business. We mm-hmm. make sure there's a couple of people who can fly the plane and that they're following checklists. So you can sit back in there in business class and uh, read the magazine. Uh, <laughs> we uh-huh. also do lots of training. I'll, I'll buy them training materials and send them through courses and train them up and increase their skill level. So each year a team member of mine is going to increase their knowledge and their ability, which is, you know, my company is a direct beneficiary of, Mm -hmm. as well as them 
and our customers. So it works for everybody. And uh, then you have to, you've got to lead properly. Uh, it's too easy just to sort of strip someone down if they've made a mistake and to make them feel bad mm -hmm. and insecure and scared. And then you sort of put a wall around their capacity to extend themselves in the future, like a turtle's keeping its head in the shell. It's just not mm -hmm. going to move forward. So there is definitely the right way and the wrong way to talk to people when you don't get the result that you wanted. And a big part of that is actually taking responsibility for how you communicated that result that you want. And if you gave them the necessary support and training and time mm -hmm. and frameworks for them to be successful in that and uh, for them to feel comfortable to let you know if they're not able to do it or, or they don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's other things. I've got a few tips in there, like how to not waste your resource. If you hire a team and you take on that responsibility, but they're sitting around with nothing to do, because I know that's a big concern. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I can hire someone, but I can't keep them busy. So I solve that problem with what I call an infinity project which is a project that your business works on that has no theoretical limit that can keep happening uh, until, you know, until the end of time. And um, that is a way to harness the energy that your team are producing. Mm, right. Yeah. That way they've got a direction and kind of a goal. That's a good one. I wanted to mention a couple of quick tips too, before we moved on from the team subject. But you, you, you really hit a key point there. Like everybody wants to be good. You know, nobody, no one shine, signs up for a job going, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suck at this so hard. Like, you know, like everybody, even if they bite off something greater they, than they can choose, there's an ambition and a desire to do it successful. And something, two things that I found helpful for me, uh, and I'm not, I've never authored a book on how to run a team or anything, but one was public praise, private criticism. That was a hard lesson I learned. Like if you have to criticize an employee, do it privately, you know, not in front of other people where they lose face. And there's now all of a sudden, like you, like you mentioned, like uh, there's a great book. It's like, what is it? 29 master plots or 30 master plots. How there's only so many different stories. And it talks about in it, like every time you introduce a new character, it, it exponentially uh, expands the complexity of the dynamics. Cause in the beginning there's a, and then there's character A and B and the relationship from A to B and B to A. And then there's character C. And there's a relationship A to B, A to C, and C to A, C, right? And back. And then when you D, and it just, it's, an, it's exponentially compounding. So if you criticize someone publicly, you just don't know how that's going to, what kind of ripples that's going to create in all those other dynamics. So uh, criticize them publicly or privately, praise them uh, publicly. And that's the whole like positive reinforcement thing. And then when you do give feedback, the sandwich principle a lot of people, and if, unless you really know from personality tests or something, um, the sandwich principle is a great way to give feedback where we've positive, negative, positive. Look, I love how you do this, and I can tell you're really ambitious, and I love that you're doing X, Y, Z, but I wish I could see this more, or you know, we're not hitting our goals here, or this might be really good. But I know because of this, with this, this, that if we sit down and get you some training that you can do you know, as expected, or something like that, but you know, just kind of sandwich it in there. Um, because especially when you're on the go and you're the uh, employer, or you're the one signing the checks and maybe you're frustrated, you know, because of whatever's going on in the business, payrolls eating up your income this month or whatever, you know, you want to make sure that you approach and you mentioned having systems. That's like a system you can use. So when you deal with staff, you make sure that you always treat them with respect and dignity and give them the benefit of the doubt. Cause as you mentioned, you know, um, you have to take ownership of why they didn't achieve that result. Cause again, everybody wants to be successful in their role. So. Yeah, so um, I do talk about sandwich technique, but I call it a shit sandwich. I, I think that's um, it's a it's not a good technique to use anymore. Oh. It's very dated. Oh, um, and the reason for that, if you think about it, if you praise someone first, they start to sort of get excited because they're you know they're getting ego stroked, and then you bury the boot like kicking them in the guts with the criticism, and they, and then then you sort of confusingly praise them again at the end and then they're like okay i'm so confused now the main thing you're teaching them is i'll never ever trust you if you praise me because i'm expecting you to dig the boot in straight after that mm, okay so, um that's it's also could be called pairing where you're pairing a negative and a positive together it's a, it makes it very confusing so i actually recommend that you just be straight up uh, like if you're not happy with something just say um, I've reviewed the work. I don't think it meets the guideline. Here's where I think it could improve. Could we do this again, please? Got it. Got it. And it's so direct. It's so straightforward. And they learn to trust you then, and they always know where they stand. 
and they're never worried about that boot about to swing when they, you know, you've just built them up. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can see how that might um, change the results you get. Yeah, no, I but, appreciate that. You know, it's, a, it's a classic case of um, a lot of, you know, management techniques do get passed down, but it's only when you're in the in the field a lot and you, you know, voraciously study different techniques and try them that you discover some of these. Now, I'm going to make you feel better here by saying that in the time that I did my draft of my book to when I actually published it, there were a few things that I actually changed my point of view on just because I had an extra five years of research. And um, there are actually a lot of common misconceptions and um, perpetuated myths that I disagree with. So in, in the title of my book, I actually call it the counterintuitive approach. So you will be reading some things that you may never have seen before. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to publish the book. It's like that Peter Thiel thing. You know, what do you know that no one else knows that, that you feel should be shared out there in the world? But that's one of them. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I can understand, I can, I can definitely see that. I'm, I'm, I'm all about results, so I don't necessarily care if I'm right or wrong. And I'm going to try what you've suggested <laughs> to see if my results change. Because at the end of the day, that's the business we're in, right? You can either be in the ego business or the results business. So if I'm wrong, I apologize to the listeners. But I definitely think that that's worth testing. Because I can see how then, like you say, they don't know whether to trust you or not. Because are you the guy that's smiling and sticking them in the gut with a knife? You know, or can you just be more direct? I, so, yeah. And I can see how it came about. It's sort of, it, it would... In, you know, it seems logical that it might be an easier way to deal with difficult stuff. But the reality is if you have a team, uh, you're going to have some difficult conversations. Yeah. At, at some point, you might have to let someone go, and that can be really mentally draining. Uh, but, you know, over years of hiring and training and, and even firing, I built up techniques that were ethical and valuable that – you know, also worked for people and, you know, letting people go is a great example. Some people really struggle with that, but I, over time was able to teach my managers who are, for the most part were fairly shy Filipino girls, um, how to let someone go. And, uh -huh. you know, if they can do it using those techniques, uh -huh. then, then, uh, they're going to work for a bold A type driver of an entrepreneur uh -huh. <laughs> um, who usually has no trouble um, having people leave, but unfortunately, <laughs> it's often the the people that don't want to leave. They just don't want to work for the tyrant anymore. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I do point, I do point um, people to the resource of the One Minute Manager as well. I think that's a great um, management book about um, helping people, you know, get praise and stuff. We tend to be always looking for what's wrong. Right. But it's nice to to look for what's right and to praise people with genuine praise without even. Um, and you need for it. So I'm often, I'm often hunting for things that I can tell my team they did good work on because I want to build that behavior reflex. Right, right. Yeah, that's because that's such an important thing because otherwise work becomes a place where, again, they're like, you know, what, what, what kick in the face am I going to wake up to today? And that's just a toxic work environment. And in fact, I think that's what you find a lot. It's anytime I've worked in or heard of and, and done any diving either with a client or something where it, someone described it as a toxic work environment, it was that sort of thing where, you know, the, the, the leader is really trying to drive it hard. And as a result is constantly fault finding, but there's none of the celebrations or wins that you would hope, you know, to have, or like you mentioned, those little things to, to celebrate about or, or to make people feel good about. And I think that's what creates the toxic environment. So that's a good point to bring out. Nice. Uh, I wanted to ask about the offer that converts. Again, that was the first chapter I wanted to dive into when I opened this up because I think anyone that's been in business any in any period of time knows that the offer is basically what your business is all about. Like, what is your offer? And it's such an important, critical thing. And there's classic cases of offers that have been offered and, and promoted for years on end without any alteration, uh, alteration at all in Domino's fresh hot pizza at your door in 30 minutes, or it's free. Uh, those of us in North America, Geico 15 minutes can save you 15% on car insurance. I mean, that has been their offer for 15, 20 years. It's never changed. I've never seen or heard anything else on radio or television. It, it's got to be an offer that converts because for them to be in business for that long and still be waving that one single flag. 
uh, you know, I'm sure that they've hired agencies and people have come in and been like, look, Geico, look, we'll take this account and we'll get you more customers and so and so is getting you with that, you know, but um, it really, I just don't think it's that easy to get an offer that converts and, and it's such a powerful asset to have. Can you kind of help the listeners a little bit? Anyone that's struggling or getting started on finding or developing an offer that converts? Absolutely. I mean, that's just as an overview. It took me nine months to make my first dollar online because it took me that long to find my offer that converts. Mm. And it's probably worth defining that it's simply you give people the opportunity to buy something from you, right? That's the offer. And then they actually buy it. <laughs> That's yeah. the converts. Yeah. A lot of people are missing the second part of that. Yeah. <laughs> they, they might have an idea. Uh, they want to go create something. They build something. They've got this fantastic new widget or they, you know, they definitely want to create this particular service. They go and spend a lot of time worrying about the business cards or the office logo mm -hmm. or getting a uniform or the company car, like everything but the, the, you know, the offer part where someone would actually buy it. So we want to get to that stage as quickly as possible because as soon as we've got an offer that converts, we actually have a business and we're in a position to make income. So usually when people say to me stuff like, oh, I can't afford to hire a team, I'd say, well, maybe you don't have an offer that converts. Uh -huh. So it is absolutely as close as you would get to the holy grail. Because yeah. once you have your offer that converts, you get a whole set of different challenges, like scaling it. Uh -huh. How do you um, help people buy more of this? How do you help them get it faster? How do you make more profit? How do you um, basically add, add products before and after this and take it to different regions and um, turn that knowledge into different markets? So that's the fun stuff. And that's where I spend a lot of my time coaching people is they've already got their offer. Now they're having other problems like hiring, training, systems, um, getting the conversion process automated, those sort of things. So some, some things to be careful about is um, starting with the idea instead of the audience. Mm. It's way better to start with an audience um, or a hungry crowd, as Gary Halbert would say. Mm -hmm. Starving crowds, even better. <laughs> if you That's think right. about that hot dog stand at three in the morning outside a nightclub with That's cockroaches right. crawling along the side and stale cheese, um, expired sauce, and half warm uh, hot dog and the, the buns have got mold on them, they're still going to sell. Yep. Um, and I'm not saying, look, we should sell shifty products. I am saying if, if you t position yourself where that starving crowd is going to be and you've got a good product, um, yeah, the odds much are in your favor. Yeah. It has to happen. It's like the marketing is taking care of it. Yeah. Um, so watch out for when people say they want something. Um, they, they might say they've got a preference, but we want to validate that by asking them to perform. Mm -hmm. So if, if you said, oh, James, uh, you know what's missing in this industry is a, a service where we could just give the audio for a podcast and then they just go and publish it for us. And I might go off and spend 50 hours building that product and come back and say, hey, guess what, Daryl, I've done that service for you now and it's just $500 a month. And you'd say, oh, well, I don't need it. I've already got a team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or 500, no, I think I'd probably pay 50 for that. Um, instead, I might say, oh, really? Well, how much would you pay for that? And you might say, well, I'll pay $50. And I might say, okay, well, I'll send you my PayPal link. You put $50 in it and send me the auto recording and we'll get started. Mm -hmm. Then you'll say, oh, uh, actually, um, yeah. I'm not really going to do my podcast after next month or whatever. So then you find out all the excuses and these are the things you have to solve to be able to get to an offer that converts. So ask for the order and see if you can validate it quickly. And a mm -hmm. great example that I use for this is um, run an event because you get paid for the event and then you can go and book the venue and run it. So you get paid first and then deliver. Same with some information products a lot of services, you can definitely get paid up front. Um, the other thing is uh, maybe you just don't want to go well. <laughs> maybe the thing that's holding you back is that you're worried that people might say no to you mm. uh, and that you feel bad. But if you don't have an offer, then they're already saying no to you. Mm -hmm. like it's 100% guaranteed that you get a no. So to put the odds more in your favor, it's good to actually start offering things. And then the other thing is people like to get all their ducks in a row and they want to have absolutely perfect before they get out into the marketplace. <laughs> but here's the thing. 
whatever you start with is really not where you're going to finish up. You, mm-hmm. you might start out with something, but it's usually going to have different iterations and you're going to change it along the way and you'll have something completely different in a few years from now. Like if you go back 10 years, firstly, I had a job 10 years ago. Uh, secondly, I was selling software for people who wanted to build a website as an affiliate that could only work on a Windows machine. Like I haven't had a Windows machine for about <laughs> seven years. <laughs> Yeah. Right, um, so my life's a lot less stressful. The um, so <laughs> basically it's going to change, and that's why I say just operate at low resolution. Just get your first draft out there and started, and learn as quickly as you can, and and um, then you can make it more technical. So um, there are some exceptions. I mean, we just talked at the beginning of this podcast about my book. I tried to get it out there. It it just didn't go. But a book is slightly different than a sales offer for mm-hmm. a service or a, an information product that is easily created and easily changed. I mean, I've created information products in hours. Um, you could uh, you could strap yourself into a motel room for a weekend with a laptop and not let yourself out of there until you create something if you really needed to. So we're only really a few days away from an offer that someone might actually give us money for. It's just a matter of us being motivated to do it and starting with an audience and knowing a lot about them so that we can um, actually help them. They've got to be better off for having this product and we've got to be able to get to those people. So we need to know where they hang out and be able to access them. And obviously Facebook's a big place where people hang out and it's fairly easy to target them these days. So that's been Uh a popular place to to get access to customers. So, you know, probably people have already asked you for things in your help desk or email uh, chain that you might be able to go back to them with and say, hey, well, I'm thinking about creating this. Would you like to be a foundation member and place an order? Uh-huh. And you could do it for a low cost just to learn how it works. Uh-huh. And quite often, not going to make a, a big profit in the beginning. But I've given a few suggestions in the chapter on how you might price things so that you do make a good profit and then how you communicate your offer to them, uh, like how you might lay out the offer, what sort of elements you might be looking for to compel someone to feel like they're going to be better off. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you should only sell good products or services. Mm-hmm. Um, and I reference a book that I got tremendous value from when I was a salesperson called Spin Selling. Mm-hmm. And rather than try and replicate the process. I just refer people to it mm-hmm. and give a basic overview of what it is. But it's a really cool way of value-based selling that helped me become the best salesperson in Australia for BMW and then Mercedes-Benz back-to-back um, using this technique that was really developed for zero salespeople. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And, and you're right, with technology that we have today, uh, Gary Halbert, like you said, start with a starving crowd. And with technology today, it's so easy to just join a Facebook group, say for dog lovers, and just comb through the comments, you know, or do keyword searches in like a, whether you just do a fine thing, you know, and, you know, frustrated, worried, you know, anxious, and like just find these pain points people have and try to find recurring themes to help you figure out what sort of offer might these people be interested in. I think that that's a really... It's, I mean, people don't even realize the power of the technology we have today. They take so much for granted. And I don't want to be on the soapbox for too long. But even something as simple as keyword research. Now, I'm not advocating SEO or anything, but I am saying that, you know, when people go to Google, they're alone in their private room or they're on their phone and they think it's just them and this machine. And they, like, confess their sins. Like, you know what I mean? They empty their brains out into this thing. And you can literally go to Google and find out how many people are searching a specific term per month. And what's so powerful about that is that gives you a predictor for churn, like, or monthly demand. How, Like, you talk about a starving crowd. That can give you an indicator of how much hunger there is for this, you know, pain point each month. Because especially with a keyword term, again, I'm not advocating, like, you know, 12 months of work to rank for SEO or anything. I think you need to do something that's faster to get it in front of people. But even just part of the research part, beyond just doing social media searches and in groups and that, you can see how big of like uh, how how big of a pain point this is for people. Because most of the time, you don't look for the same thing in Google over and over and over and over and over again, right? Like you know, if you're traveling somewhere, if you've got a you know, uh, like lately I've been waking up with headaches and I think it's because I'm grinding my teeth at night. You know, like I, I search for it a couple times and boom, then I'm done. But when you look that up, like 
you know, like searching for people that are, are, are looking for keyword terms around grinding their teeth at night or waking up with a headache. You know, that's a monthly recurring thing. And those are probably a lot of those new people every month. So when you try to think of planning a business and how big of a market, you know, or how many people are out there with that, that can, I mean, the tools today we have are so powerful. You know, you and I are communicating, you know, on different, on different islands. Uh, I mean, we're on the same side of the planet at least, but it's just, it's so powerful. And so I, th- I really feel like the fundamentals, and that's part of what I loved about your book is the fundamentals are super important and it's easy to get lost in them and distracted by shiny objects. But the fundamentals are fundamental for a reason. That's something I learned when I did martial arts. I learned after training for about three, four years that I didn't really care about the new flashy, shiny stuff. There, there's something going around now, at least in some of the circles I'm in, like there's software tools that will auto comment on like your Facebook ads and stuff, you know, to like, you know, to boost engagement. Like, I don't really care about that stuff because it's just a shiny tactic and it's not. I mean, when I did martial arts, what I learned was there's all sorts of new shiny techniques that come out. But, you know, whether you're a brand new white belt or a black belt at the world championships, the fundamentals work on everyone. And so, you know, and virtue, which is it, virtuosity, uh, Greg Glassman, uh, the founder of CrossFit, wrote this thing about uh, virtuosity, how virtue is doing the, uh, the common uncommonly well. You know, and that's kind of what you get What the world class black belt level. You get black belts that do these fundamental movements that even newbies learn in their first week but they do it so well this other person who's been training for 12 years sees it coming but can't stop it do you know what i mean like that sort of stuff and so that's again one of the things i love about your book is just the the focus on those types of fundamentals like just what's your offer that converts i love that is is there anything in the book or do you have any recommendations for anyone that's starting out or struggling with like okay i got an offer that converts but like they're nervous about making like what if these people hear me make a different offer than i made those people like how do they test the offer is there a goal they should have for how many sales anything like that that you would use as a rule of thumb well i think the goal of one sale would be enough and don't worry about all that tech you just need another human to talk to this when i talk low resolution i mean you can be just talking to someone face to face you don't need any tech at all Mm -hmm. i'll give you an example i've got a friend who has a service she's completely fully subscribed she's got people waiting on a waiting list uh, to deal to deal with what she supplies she does not have a domain does not have a website doesn't have a telephone number she doesn't have a business name mm-hmm. all she has is one google form that people fill out when they want her service. She's got one person who sends her referrals, uh, which is me. (laughs) And (laughs) then when people fill out the form, she sends them an email and then she um, provides a service and and when they're happy, they pay. And she's borrowing my shopping cart, but that's it. There's very low tech. She could easily just send them a PayPal invoice. So. Mm -hmm. Just to break that down, she's got email, a Google form, and a PayPal. That, that's all she needs in her business to generate a substantial income because her offer converts. People want what she's got, and she's very, very good. And um, that's just, just, you know, I'm often coaching people who get so caught up in all the, the stuff. They worry about their website and their domain, um, their logo, you don't need any of that stuff. That's like optional. Mm-hmm. But if you can meet someone face to face or speak to them over the telephone, that's as much tech as you need to get started. They could, they could give you cash or a check or put money into your bank account. You don't need all the tech. That's just a luxury once you find out what it is that uh, converts. And a lot of my original sales were telephone assisted sales. And even my high end sales now for my Silver Circle program, it's still a telephone assisted sale. Mm-hmm. In essence, I speak to someone before they are allowed to join. And if I approve them and if they want to come on board, then I send them a link where they can purchase. Mm-hmm. And that's the only way into the program. And it works. I mean, it's a $10,000 starting price mm-hmm. for them. And it's worth it for me to be on the phone from an effective hourly rate perspective mm-hmm. to have that telephone call. But that's what makes an amazing product because of the strict quality control and the hoops that people jump through to be in the program. And 
by only working with winners, I'm able to make sure that I maximize their results. So Mm -hmm. that's a very low resolution offer. Like none of the tech stuff's involved in that. And I'm not sure uh, the last time I did keyword research, but I think that's, that's probably a more difficult way to go if you don't have to just talk to humans <laughs> mm-hmm. get get on Skype and chat to someone and find out what their challenge is and see if you can solve it if you can you're going to have an offer that converts mm, 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 mm. Now how about scaling up certain things what are some of the biggest challenges you see some of your clients facing in trying to scale their offers in their businesses team it's usually there's two aspects that that you have to consider when you're scaling it's the marketing side of it and the capacity side of it so some people have a red hot offer and their marketing is great, but they can't deliver. So the capacity is the constraint. Other people have got a surplus of capacity, but they're having trouble communicating the offer or selling enough of it. So they're the ones focusing, you know, churning through three different Facebook uh, suppliers, trying to find the one that can magically turn their mm-hmm. reasonable offer into an amazing offer. The people with the amazing offer are generally... Um, they're really good at what they do, but they um, have to learn a whole new set of skills like building a team and um, setting up all the systems to harness the energy that they've been able to create. So, I mean, I spoke to a client this morning and he's um, he's been on board for 18 months and when he started, he had five people in the business and he was occupying 500 square meters or feet, I'm not sure. Now he's got 20 people and he's up to 1,500 square feet, uh, whatever the office space is. And uh, they've had a 205% increase in revenue in that 18 months. So he's just in a massive growth phase. So his level of challenge is, you know, what are the right actions for him? Where's the best place for him to spend his time? Now he's in a software as a service business so I've got him off the programming and now into the managing of the manager's type of mm-hmm, activities mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and he's just going leaps and bounds. So now they're looking at um, doing a video documentary to let other people in the industry know they exist and they're attending live events that have thousands of attendees and they're doing uh, research to compile things that uh, inform and educate their market and going so they can do publishing of, of more content on an ongoing basis, which will satisfy people who are interested in becoming a customer, people who are already a customer, and people who used to be a customer who should be coming back because there's been changes or innovations. Mm, 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 mm. Got it, got it, got it, got it. This has all been fantastic tips. Again, for those that are, are listening, it's James's book, Work Less, Make More. Highly recommend you check it out. James, what's your favorite part of your book? <laughs> Finishing it. Um, <laughs> gee, I don't know. I, I think probably no compromise uh, because that could have been the title of the book. And it really defines the way that I live my life now is that I've reduced the amount of compromise that I used to have in my life that that has made my life better because if we are in a loop you want it to be a good loop right Mm -hmm. and i've basically removed things that were frustrations or um just in hindsight not as effective as they could have been so it's really um i put a couple of case studies in there of people i've helped remove compromise but you know people just get so stuck they paint themselves into corners and if you start questioning some of the, the things that you're doing, you will actually come up with counterintuitive ways to um, overcome it. Like people talk about getting locked out of Facebook or their YouTube account got shut down or whatever. I mean, they've compromised themselves and put themselves in that position. It's not YouTube's fault or Facebook's fault. It's their fault. And you can protect yourself from that by thinking about how you might um, – go about it a different way. So I encourage people to think more and not just blindly do what uh, all the experts suggest that they do. I want mm. people to come up with their own conclusions. Mm, 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 mm. Very well said. Very, very, very well said. James, this is, as always, has been a super insightful interview. I want to just leave a couple of minutes just because is there anything that I should have asked you that I haven't asked you yet? We could ask me what's causing the headache. <laughs> what's causing the headache? <laughs> 
I would I'd be looking at gluten. I'd be I would cut wheat, soy, barley, and rye for two weeks and see if your headaches disappear because there's a pretty good chance that um, it could be causing your teeth to grind um, because your body might be reacting to it. Mm, that's a fantastic suggestion. Um, but I don't, I don't, I, all I eat are plants and protein. That's all I eat. I don't eat rice. I don't eat pasta. I don't eat bread. I cut all that out. I've been doing CrossFit now for about two and a half, three years. And, uh, even just noticing the difference with my, my, my parents, my adoptive parents, the parents I grew up with, they cook super clean. But even when they cook, I noticed the meals that were just plant-based and meat-based. I always felt better when I went to the gym afterwards. And so now I've tried to flip to that exclusively. So I, I, that's all I pretty much eat is vegetables, fruit, and then meat, eggs, milk, you know. Um, but I appreciate nice that. Yeah, you I've, made a big step. I know it's often hidden in sources. It's extremely hard to eat where you are now in the Philippines. Um, gluten-free. <laughs> it can be, yeah. This country, it's all <laughs> rice and meat. Everywhere you go, it's rice and meat. <laughs> What yeah, and the is- meat's got soy in it, and um, they like still don't mind a bit of MSG. Ah, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, no. Luckily, we have a housekeeper, and she comes a couple times a week. I have her going and getting our groceries and coming, and and so we can focus on the, the effective things, or even just enjoying our time off. My girlfriend and I. So she helps handle that, and I hate waiting in grocery lines, especially here. It's just really inefficient. You could spend, you could go into the grocery store for five minute items like pick up two things and then spend a half hour waiting in the checkout line. So, uh, no, most of it's all cooked from home and that, but I will pay closer attention to the sauces than anything else. Uh, well, the other thing is, um, I'd be looking at, uh, meditation mm-hmm. because maybe you're grinding mm-hmm. your teeth cause you've got some stress deep or trauma or stress. Yep. And the third thing is you can actually get a mouth guard that stops your teeth from contacting each other. That, that would be like a shock absorber. And yeah. if you, you sleep with a mouth guard that can stop you losing the enamel on your teeth. Yeah, those are great suggestions. That's the mouth guard came a priority yesterday, and the meditation and just stretching before night. I remember when I was in my 20s, I I had a mountain biking injury and I I was on crutches for six weeks, and I was going to the chiropractor all the time. And my my aunt at the time said, "Why don't you just take up yoga instead of paying all this money to a chiropractor?" And so I started doing yoga in like my like my late teens, like 18, 19, 20. And I got into a really good yoga routine or habit for about three years, stretching every day. And I used to tell myself, 20 minutes of stretching is worth an hour of sleep. So if I was rushing for sleep, I'm like, oh, I only got seven hours of sleep. I knew that even if I went to bed, you know, it took me, you know, because people are dilatory, right? So even if it took me an hour to get 20 minutes of actual stretching done, it would be more worthwhile because I would wake up feeling more refreshed and have a better quality sleep. And I think that that, like that, and like you mentioned, meditation is what I need to do now. Because I uh, the mouth guard, I, I saw that as one of the results, and I, I definitely want to try. I mean, I'll try. Like I said, I'm about results. I don't care about ego. So I'll try 20 different solutions if that's what it takes. But my concern is that maybe I, I don't want to, like, be boastful. But, I mean, I go to the gym five days a week. I'm pretty friggin' strong compared to where I was, you know, four or five years ago. So my concern with the mouth guard is that it might just be, like, flexing my jaw that much. So I think the two combine. Like, I'm going to try meditation, doing some stretching before bed, and a mouth guard, and just see how that helps because uh, they're just mild headaches and they disappear after I'm awake for a couple hours. But I, I really think it's something to do with that. Like squeezing you know, my When I length. escaped the corporate bubble and went into my own business over the last few years, I've had so much help health wise to um, fix some of the damage that I'd done to my own body mm. just from, you know, bad mm-hmm. posture, uh, working too many hours, not getting enough sleep, mm-hmm. uh, not exercising enough, just had, Massive transformations, and I tell you, my friend Clint Patterson, who is helping rheumatoid arthritis sufferers, okay. he swears by hot yoga. He mm. said that it's like the number one thing. He hates it. It's really hard to do, but it is the by far the best solution for people with body problems. Yeah, yeah. That actually, when I anytime I've had any real serious aches or pains, or I've had a couple of injuries from weightlifting, I, I would go do hot. That used to be my go-to when I was in Canada in February. Every month, no matter what I was doing, I would go get a pass for a hot yoga center. Do like the 6 a.m. because I just found when it's minus 22 outside, it really gets your day started. You know, it's really nice to get out of bed <laughs> and go sit. It. Yeah, and sweat in a room for a while. It just like it's almost like you're 
like you're trying to heat a potato to like you know have enough thermal energy to get through the day. I'm uh, putting a one mil wetsuit top on <laughs> as soon as the water gets below 21 degrees <laughs> Celsius. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, but no, th- those are so. You mentioned three fundamentals, and this almost we should almost make sure this is mentioned at the beginning. But those three fundamentals are so critically important, like exercise, diet, and sleep. Sleep is such a magical thing. I really used to be one of those badge wearers that was like, I only sleep six hours a night and I am the exact opposite now. I like, I reschedule meetings. I can't, I'd cancel a meeting with Barack Obama if I was, sorry, Barack, you know, I only slept six hours last night. Come talk to me in two hours. Like it's so, it's so magical. It's so healing. I had food poisoning and you know what the solution was? Sleep. You know what I mean? Like well, I just got that's some when sleep. your body repairs. So. It's just, yeah. Um, the other fundamental, which doesn't get talked about much is breathing mm, and mm. i've learned a bit about this in the last few years especially on this maldives mastermind that i go on um, we learn how to breathe properly and we increase our lung capacity and i've watched people go from and, and this happened to me too you can go from holding your breath for like 17 seconds to almost three minutes mm, mm. in just one session mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's amazing it is amazing breath and is- most of us breathe for like uh, our whole life do you have any good recommendations for anything like that? I played clarinet for five years as a kid, which was a wind instrument. So I've always noticed I've done well with breathing stuff. But then after years in my teens of smoking pot, and I did smoke cigarettes for a few years, you know, you lose the capacity. But I've, it's there's also the Wim Hof method. It's something I've been dabbling in. It's such a, there's a breathology too. I forget his name. I met the guy. He was about breathing. It is a really powerful one because you're you can change your state just by changing your breath. You know, and breath is one of those weird things. You know, Alan Watts is this great meditation track where he talks about how it's a great metaphor for life because in our lives we feel like we're we're you know we're doing our lives, we're affecting our lives. You know, but even when we're not thinking about or planning or whatever, you know, our lives still kind of happen. It's kind of like your breath. You know, this whole interview, I haven't really been thinking about my breath, but it's still been happening. You know, but if I stop and think about it, I do have control over it, and through <clears throat> controlling my breath. I can, you know, I can improve my brain capacity by providing more oxygen to my brain. I can, you know, slow down my breathing. I can relax more. I, it's just amazing what people are able to do. Wim Hof, they did something where they injected them with some flu virus, and they were able to reduce their symptoms in like 20 minutes or something, where most people would be in serious pain for like 24 hours. It's, it is a powerful, 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 powerful thing, so... Yeah, it wasn't on my radar until I became a surfer because you do get held under when the waves are big, mm. and it it just it just fast tracks the relationship that you start having with yourself on a mental basis, like the the relationship you have with fear, and um, you know panic. You you feel like you want to come to the surface, and you feel like um, you're out of control, mm-hmm. and it it impacts your ability to paddle onto the next wave. So. Um, the best resource that is widely available and free <laughs> is maybe the episode that I recorded with Nam Baldwin, who's a breathing coach for Mick Fanning, a multiple world champion surfer. Mm. And he taught a mindset te- technique to deal with um, difficult situations. And that acronym is called NEAT uh, that he talked about. I've really sort of embodied that and it's helped me now to tackle more difficult situations and to feel calm and relaxed and to maximize my energy. Mm, mm. And where do we find that? Uh, it's on uh, superfastbusiness.com. It's uh, one of the, the episodes. I'll get you the number of it, but Nan Baldwin is it's just a, a very knowledgeable guy. Mm. And uh, and really well known in our industry. He actually got referred to me by one of my students, who's a swimming coach. It was episode 529, and the whole philosophy was like, whatever happens, use it, because mm. stuff's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's just how you use it then. And he he went quite deep into mindset and meaning and um, about blockers. What sort of blocks us what moves us i found it fascinating it's actually my favorite podcast that i've ever recorded and i've probably recorded a thousand of them wow uh, and he's he's saying like if you're an athlete then really the mind is the athlete mm-hmm. the rest is just the encasement around it yep yeah yeah a lot of the performance enhancing things uh like 
pre-workouts and all that, it just, it helps. It's called your perceived level of exertion. It just, it changes your brain stimulate, like the chemical receptors, your brain. So that way you don't, you know, wimp out too soon. Even caffeine, caffeine is one of the best pre-workouts there are. And it's, it's very well documented. If you take it, if you drink more than a cup of coffee a couple of times a week, it won't work for you. But if you don't, it's a fantastic one. And all it really does is it expands your perceived level of exertion. You know, and it's it's amazing that what your body can do. Every year for the CrossFit Open, I always get jacked up on caffeine and stuff for my workouts. Um, you know, nothing that's not not fine. But it's because, you know, you're thrown down against your buddies. It's showtime, right? But I, I'm always impressed because I like to see my benchmark, like just, I call it like my limit strength, like just when I'm, you know, just showing up, whatever. And then when it's go time like that, and it's it really is just, it's just a mental thing. It's, you know, it's the fear. Am I going to, I'm going to hurt myself. I'm pushing too hard. I'm, you know, and, and it's just, I think the Navy SEALs have a saying that when you feel that you're at your limit, when you feel like everything's going to break, it's your brain having its throttling, its governor on to protect you, but you're really only actually at 40%. Well, the 40% rule. You're only at 40% of what your full capacity is. There's a guy, David Goggins. He's like an ultra marathon runner. He's like run races where he's like bleeding and his feet are broken and he's still running in like another 6K to finish the race. And uh, he talks about that a lot, like that mental toughness and just going deep and just overcoming those things. And I, I think that's extremely powerful. We don't even really know what we're capable of. We just know, I mean, a lot of people, again, they take it for granted. I mean, if you're a human, that's such an incredible thing. That's such a gift in and of itself. Like I love my dog, but no matter how much I love my dog, she'll only ever do the handful of things a dog can do, right? That's all she's ever going to do. But as a human, any of us at any point in time could do anything. I mean, we invented flight. I mean, everyone takes it for granted right now. We have to remember this was, do you know what I mean? Like at the time when this came about, this would be as crazy as me saying, I'm just going to unzip my flesh and step out of it looking five years younger. People be like, okay, Daryl, like, I said I would open up a portal in my hand and I would have a face-to-face conversation with another person on the other side of the world. 15 years ago, people would have thought I was a wizard. You know, like we do amazing things as humans. We set weird goals that people think are impossible and we make it possible. We achieve it. We've doubled our life expectancy. We're going to do it more. I set a personal goal to live to be 300 because why not? There's no reason why we can't. Right now, if I said <laughs> I wanted to live to be 100, everyone would think that that's a reasonable goal. Well, I'm 34. That's two more lifetimes there's a medical breakthrough. It's not going to be five years. It's not a breakthrough. We added five years. Of human life. That's not a breakthrough. It's going to be like 150 is now the new benchmark. And you know what I mean? I'm just going to chase that to the end. So I, it's, it's an amazing thing to be human. You can literally do anything. And especially in today's day and age, there's experts like you and I out there that have our own little niches. And there's no reason why people can't plug into the people they need to learn what they need to know to accomplish the goals they've set for themselves. And I really think that like like it's the fundamentals. It's like you said, people getting caught up into other people's plans. Uh, there's some videos recently, and Mark Zuckerberg actually released a statement on Facebook about this, about how uh, there's been some executives from Facebook that have left that have said that they're concerned that it's destroying the fabric of our society because it's in designed to increase engagement and just and even just the ability of people to pay to advertise certain things. Popularity is often taken as proof of concept or proof of truth. And people have been using that for their own political and, and malicious aims and that, you know, and just even just having people so sucked into it uh, that there's been concerned about that. But if you can protect yourself and like, even just for me, I don't, I don't think I had that problem, but just by following the examples you gave in your book, shutting those notifications on, I felt like I gained a couple more hours of my day back every day. And using that time yeah, tracker, like, like I'm, you, I'm hardly ever on Facebook because it's right. it just... It's the last place you want to go for a happy life. It's scientifically proven that it will depress you. Because mm, you're always keeping up with the Joneses. And everybody, and it's easy to have a polished life that look, I mean, everyone can Photoshop their life this day and age, you know, but that's, what is it? It's, um, I forget, but create a life that feels good on the inside, not just looks good on the outside. That's been a motto of mine for a number of years now, because that's, you know, I, I, a guy, a friend of mine, he came here to the Philippines and he met this woman and he, he started a nonprofit here and he just messaged me. We weren't able to meet up, but he sent me, he's like, Oh, I met this amazing woman. And you know, and da, da, da. And then he kind of like, I could tell he was feeling self-conscious. He's like, yeah, well, you know, she's a little younger than me. And you know, she, she didn't finish high school. And I, you know, I had to tell him, I'm like, man, it's, it's your life. Like, I don't care. Like, you know, like as long as you're happy, you're my friend. That's all I really care about. As long as you feel you're making the right decisions and you're happy, like do you man, you know, like, cause he was, he was like trying to, you know, when people come and they try to justify all their life decisions, and I think it's not like I'm immune to wanting to people please and, and seek approval of others, but it can be a really destructive thing, again, especially on social media. 
and it, it, it encourages in some ways really destructive behavior. I mean, that's where you get like <clears throat> girls with Instagram accounts. That's like a thousand pictures of her ass and it's got a million followers. Like that's a weird <sighs> human when that happens. Like what have, what have people done to her psyche? Like the, you know what I mean? Like that, like it just, it, there's gotta be some issues going on in that brain when you've got millions of followers that care about your ass, but you open your mouth and no one seems to want to notice. Like, it's just, it's a weird way to splice the world. And so again, you just gotta, you have to protect yourself. It's, it is in some ways a bit of the, you know, survival of the fittest. I mean, look what we do to chickens and pigs and cows, you know, like, you know, we kind of harvest them for us. And there's other things out in the world that want to do that to us as well. And uh, you have to protect yourself from them. But if you stay safe from those dangers, you can literally accomplish and have and do anything you want. And so anyways, a bit of a rant there, but. Uh, <laughs> well, the main thing is like, just, just uh, what is it? Nirvana is like letting go. It's about not being attached. Yeah. So you know, that's really why I made that book. You can work less and make more. Mm-hmm. And I tried to give the toolkit for that. Yeah, and it is possible. I will speak to that. I I will say I validate it myself. So, James, thank you so much. Again, I'm a huge fan of the book. I'm going to dive in and finish it because so far I've been a huge fan of everything else we've done. Uh, again, like I said, the last interview we did, those that are listening may want to go check that out. It was one of my favorites for sure. Uh, it's the only time I've ever listened to someone on this podcast that I've put some like 200 episodes now where I was like, if I was going to go for a mentor right now, I'd seek out James just because of the down-to-earth practicality, no-nonsense and usefulness and just how I I'm definitely not perfect, but I feel like I've, I've been fortunate enough to experience and learn from a lot of great people and it doesn't take a whole day to recognize sunshine. And so I definitely know you've got the good. So anyone that was looking for something to read, definitely check out work less, make more James Shramko S C H R A M K O or check out superfastbusiness.com. I'm sure you can find a link to the book there. You can also find James's stuff. And what episode was that podcast you did with Neem? Um, with Nam, Nam, Nam. <laughs> Nam, it was episode 529. There we go. So go check out superfastbusiness.com, episode 529, if you want to know how to improve your breathing. And uh, again, James, just thank you again for coming and sharing. It's always an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. It's um, definitely one of the most interesting podcasts I get to come on. <laughs> <laughs> You've reached the end of our interview. Now, first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.